Yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here, um, especially given all the advances we've seen in approximate Bayesian inference recently. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you about some of our work, uh, work with these fine collaborators here. <clears throat> but first, to set the stage, I'm going to talk about other people's work. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that I think have been really exciting in the last four or five years um, that our work builds on. So in particular, I'm going to talk about natural gradient SVI for nice probabilistic graphical models. And I'm going to talk about uh, various alarm encoders and inference networks. Um, there's a lot of work behind uh, both of these ideas now. Um, I'm just going to highlight the, the high-level bits. <clears throat> so I'll start out by talking about natural gradient SVI for nice probabilistic graphical models. And by nice, I mean uh, models that we build out of exponential family distributions with nice, uh, lots of conjugacy structure and uh, uh, lots of things that we can exploit. So to give you a concrete example, uh, <clears throat> this is one such nice uh, model distribution. So this is uh, a linear Gaussian dynamical system. Think of the x's as these linear Gaussian states over time. <clears throat> and then the y's are linear Gaussian observations. So everything, the x's and the y's, everything's linear Gaussian. And on theta, we're going to put a conjugate prior, an exponential family conjugate prior. So somehow this is you know, one of the nicest models, latent variable models we can imagine having. So I'm going to talk about uh, variational inference uh, in this kind of model. We can do uh, a structured variational mean field inference in this model. And in particular, to approximate the posterior distribution, given some observations y, we're going to write down some variational distribution q that we're going to enforce for tractability uh, uh, that factorizes over as q theta and q of x. All right. And so what I'm going to show you is all of the ways we can take advantage of this model structure to make a really nice inference learning algorithm. Uh, so first, it turns out that we can say the optimal uh, uh, densities over all possible densities for Q of theta and Q of x, uh, they stay in the same exponential families as their, as their conditionals. And so I'm going to write the variational objective as a function of the natural parameters for Q of theta and Q of x. I'm going to write natural parameters with eta. And so the natural parameters for Q of theta are eta sub theta. And the natural parameters of Q of x are eta sub x. I'm highlighting the eta sub x in blue so you can keep your eye on it. So this is the, the you know, usual sort of variational evidence lower bound and, and uh, in terms of sort of concrete parameters. So you can imagine that we could do gradient descent on this thing, right? And then maybe we have a lot of latent variables or something. Maybe it's like a thousand dimensional problem. We just do generic gradient descent. Uh, we can do better than that. So in fact, because this problem is so nice, we can perfectly optimize out one of the parameters as a function of the other. In fact, the bigger parameter. We can optimize out eta sub x perfectly. <clears throat> so I've written here that we can write eta sub x as a function of eta sub data, where we're defining it to be an argmax. OK? And then I'm going to define a single argument version of the objective that's just eta sub data. I'll call that uh, LSVI. So that's just plugging into our original elbow, this partially optimized version. So that's pretty nice. Now you can think we can do gradient descent over a much smaller space. That's a big win. It turns out we can do more than just generic gradient descent. So this is what uh, Matt Hoffman and, and other collaborators worked on maybe 2010 to 2013. It turns out that we can do natural gradient descent on this objective. It turns out we can actually do natural gradient descent faster than we do flat gradient descent. Uh, we don't even have to do like a backwards pass. We can just do a forwards pass and then compute exact natural gradients uh, this way. So the, the details of this expression that I've written down on the bottom aren't very important. Uh, the highlights are just that we can write natural gradients of our objective in terms of some expected sufficient statistics using our sort of locally optimal factor. So this is super nice. Natural gradient descent is a sort of uh, generalized Gauss-Newton method that tends to have much faster convergence than, than flat gradient descent. And if we have many such conditionally independent observations, if I draw these boxes, these plates up there, we can actually just write our gradient descent as, some, as a sum of expected sufficient statistics. So we can just immediately do Monte Carlo and, and do our stochastic gradient descent thing. Um, <clears throat> so to give you an idea of what this algorithm looks like for, for this model, there are three steps. So the first step is you would sample a data mini-batch. You would then, there's our data mini-batch. You then use your observation model, these nice linear Gaussian observations, to compute node potentials. Okay, that's step one, your evidence potentials. 
then you would run fast message passing algorithm to sort of stitch the evidence from these local evidence potentials together with your model. Uh, do I have to press? Yeah, good. <clears throat> so that was message passing, and then step three is essentially there is no step three. We use that information that we just computed, and we can just write a simple expression for the natural gradient. That's the whole algorithm. Super nice. One other thing I want to highlight here is that using these kinds of methods, we can answer arbitrary inference queries. So if you give me any pattern of observations and ask me to sort of do inference on the latent variables for the rest, no problem. We can do that um, uh, just using graphical model ideas. Okay, so that was a really nice uh, model. Of course, we don't always uh, think we can model our data using those kinds of special structures. Uh, and so you might ask, what about more general observation models? Right? What if we're trying to model a time series, but it doesn't look anything like linear Gaussian? Maybe it's a movie, right? a sequence of, of uh, images. Then you might expect we need to use a more general observation model than just some linear Gaussian observation of our states. In particular, you might think, maybe we should try a neural network observation model. So here I've just rewritten the same model, except now I've highlighted in red that we're going to imagine that we're getting sort of, instead of these nice linear Gaussian observations of our state, we're getting some neural network observations of our state. So think of each Y as a frame in a movie. <clears throat> and then we have these neural network sort of decoder models to produce images. And I've written gamma just to split out the sort of neural network parameters there. So what breaks down? Like what, you know, what goes wrong? So we can do the same thing essentially as before, where we say we have uh, some structured variational family over our linear variables. Um, we can assume that you know, we don't have this result anymore that the, you know, the, the optimal latent factors have particular parametric forms. We just impose parametric forms, right? No big deal. We can say that maybe the, the latent factor on Q of X is still a Gaussian. The problem is that when we write our variational objective now, we have this really difficult likelihood term. Before this likelihood term, because of conjugacy, we just fold it back into, the, into our prior, and everything was nice. Now, in particular, if we tried to do this SVI thing, this natural reading SVI thing, where we optimize the local variational factor as sort of a subroutine when we're doing gradient descent, now this optimization problem becomes hard. It's hard in the sense that it's just a fairly generic nonlinear program. And so it's not easy to compute the optimal parameters of our local variational factor. And this is essentially a non-starter because this would mean that in the inner loop for every stochastic gradient uh, uh, we try to compute to, to optimize our variational parameters, we'd have to be solving some generic nonlinear programming problem to do inference you know, in this difficult neural network posterior. So this is really, you know, basically everything broke down at the first step. Uh, and so we need, we need something else to handle general observations. So that's where these sort of variational autoencoder and, and neural network type ideas uh, come in. So I'm just gonna be, you know, the highest level uh, view of these things. There's been an explosion of work uh, uh, recently on, on these ideas. So, in, a, in the most vanilla sort of variational autoencoder, the latent variable model is a bit simpler. Let's say there's no dependence over time. We just have some uh, latent variables x, and these like Gaussian uh, zero identity. And we have this neural network observation model. So our problem before was that, you know, we wanted to take a data mini batch and then produce uh, a variational factor over our local latent variables. And to do that, we, you know, before we're running some optimization routine, but, you know, that, that seems super hard to do in an inner loop. So what can we do that's much faster so that takes an observation and produces a variational factor? Maybe we can turn it into a learning problem, right? Maybe we can think of it as a regression. And we can just say, let's parameterize the, you know, the, uh, our variational factor in terms of some mu and, and sigma parameters, and let's just write those as some parametric function applied to the corresponding observation, right? <clears throat> Has anyone seen a nice, you know, general class of nonlinear uh, regression functions that we can use and train efficiently with gradient descent? Uh, I think I know some, right? We can use neural networks. Neural networks have a nice fixed cost to evaluate, right? And we think they'll play nicely with, with gradient descent type ideas. So if you do this, you can write, uh, you, have, you can end up writing a, uh, your variational uh, objective in terms of now sort of our, our uh, you know, neural network parameters or the, or the parameters of the variational factor on the neural network parameters. 
Um, and these recognition model parameters, these phi. Uh, and it turns out that through some uh, you know, nice Monte Carlo methods, we can just do gradient, stochastic gradient descent on this objective directly. So we can learn simultaneously this sort of inference network that's going to take an observation and, and you know, do our local variable inference for us, and uh, the sort of forward generated model parameters. This is really great. Uh, there's a, as, I, as I've said, there's a ton of work here. Uh, I, can't, I can't do it justice. I'm just going to highlight a couple of recent things in sort of the time series context that, that I found really excellent. Um, there's some work out of uh, uh, Columbia where people have looked at structuring their uh, recognition models so that you know, instead of producing some diagonal uh, Gaussian factor or some dense Gaussian factor, let's produce some Gaussian factor that's structured in a, in a sort of time series way. Um, I sort of sketched how you might imagine this recognition ne network might produce node potentials and edge potentials and give you a nice you know, tri block tridiagonal uh, precision matrix. There's another line of work out of uh, David Sontag's group at uh, uh, NYU uh, that, again, sort of sketched a picture, but the idea is you can imagine designing an inference network for time series that looks kind of like a bidirectional RNN um, to, to produce no potentials. This picture is actually not the most general version. They have a way of kind of approximating the structural factor. Um, uh, this picture gets the idea across. So lots of great stuff. Um, with variational autoencoders and these, this big idea of, of inference networks. So I just want to uh, put down you know, a comparison of these two lines of work. So with natural gradient SVI, uh, our big problem with it was that it was expensive for general observation models, right? And that was why you know, we think we have to, to move beyond it. However, it was really nice when we had it. Right? When we have all this model structure, it let us do a lot. Um, in particular, it let us compute efficiently the optimal local variational factor. Let us exploit all the conjugacy and graphical model structure that we had in our model. In particular, that let us answer arbitrary inference queries. You shade in any nodes, and I'll be able to, to answer an inference about it. Um, and we got to compute some natural gradients, natural gradients over uh, all of our decision variables. So I'd like to line that up against variational autoencoders uh, and, and talk about some of their strengths and weaknesses. Of course, the big one is that they're fast for general observations, right? Uh, uh, we just have to run this, this neural network. But I think there are some disadvantages as well. Some things that we lost, right? When, of course, we had much more when we had all this structure that we could explain in our model. <clears throat> so in particular, uh, I should say that you know, when we're learning this inference network, um, we have to learn sort of from scratch how to do all of our latent variable inference. And as our latent variable models become more complex, that might be much harder. Right? Maybe if you're a true believer in neural nets, you think they can approximate anything. But at least it'll become very data intensive to do that. You'll have to learn how to do inference that might be very hard to learn. Also, you know, we lost this ability to answer arbitrary inference queries. Um, if you train an inference network, it's sort of a, a circuit that's specific to the inference query that you had in mind ahead of time. So uh, you might not be able to answer as many inference queries. You can, you can have sort of a, a super constant. If you design your inference network to do sort of solve filtering problems, maybe you can solve a linear number of inference queries and the number of nodes in your graphical model. Um, but you know, before with PGMs, we can answer an exponential number of, uh, of inference queries. So as you might guess, uh, you know, the way I've set up these two columns here, I'm now going to talk about some of our work, which uh, you know tries to combine the strengths of both of these uh, methods. Um, these are things we call structured variational autoencoders, and just to compare, we really want to take all of the strengths of both of these things and put them together as best we can. Um, so we want to be fast for general observation models, like neural net observation models, uh, but we also want to be able to, uh, you know, if we have some graph the model structure over our latent variables, we want to be able to exploit that and get all the wins that we had before. <clears throat> so here's the idea, essentially, in, in one line. Uh, we're going to have recognition networks, but instead of having them perform all of our inference for our local latent variables all at once in one shot, we're going to have them produce graph the model potentials. In fact, we're going to have them produce nice graphical model potentials, conjugate graphical model potentials, so we can be working with our latent variable models. Then, with those graphical model potentials, we're sort of back in graphical model land, we do all of our nice PGM inference algorithms. That's the idea. Let me just outline for you a, a sketch of, of how it works. Uh, so this is our example model. Remember, we had this, uh, these 
sort of nice lingerable model upstairs, right? A linear Gaussian dynamical system, maybe conjugate prior on its parameters. And then we had this you know, general neural network observation model for images. That meant that we got these, this difficult likelihood term in red. So, you know, in this model, this is like a frame by frame observation, right? For every, for every frame, we have a linear code. So, we can think about the problem as saying that <clears throat> we really have this nasty observation potential that's induced by conditioning on an image and sort of pulling that information back through the neural network. Right, we have this difficult potential. So I've drawn it here as a function of x of t, every, every x node here. We have some difficult potential. That's really what breaks all of our conjugacy and, and causes our problems. So what we're going to do instead is we're just going to replace it. And in fact, we're going to learn to replace it with some nice potential, right? Some nice Gaussian approximation that just approximates the evidence from that one frame at that, at that node. So what this looks like uh, symbolically is that we're going to replace this difficult red term just with a nice tractable term, okay? just with a nice uh, uh, set of potentials that is conjugate to our latent variable model. That's what we'll do. And in fact, this will have, these will be recognition networks just like before. They'll have some neural network parameters phi, and we'll be able to learn them uh, so that they learn to approximate these, these evidence potentials. Um, the sort of recognition network graph the models have end up drawing uh, in the upper right look a lot like conditional random fields. In this instance, it is exactly a conditional random field. And so basically our, you know, the idea is to use CRFs or CRF-like things to do our, our inference for us. Um, so we've defined this nice tractable objective where we replace the uh, you know, difficult observation potential with something nice. Then we're just going to choose our local variational factor to optimize against this conjugate uh, evidence. Uh, we can do that efficiently. This is all just like back in, in natural gradient, uh, you know, PGM SVI land. And then once we optimize that, we're going to plug it back into our uh, variational objective to get this objective I'll call the SVAE objective. So I don't have time to go into uh, so many details um, about you know, why we think this is a good idea and how everything works out nicely. So I'm going to show you a cartoon of what this algorithm could look like uh, for a slightly more complex model, for a switching linear dynamical system. So it starts off like before, we sample a data in the batch, like a sequence. But then we apply our recognition network to get our graphical model potentials. In this case, all I'm showing is node potentials, but uh, in general, just get graphical model potentials. <clears throat> Step two is going to be we're going to run our fast uh, PGM inference algorithms. Uh, so in this case, we might be running message passing, doing local mean field, very you know, uh, uh, quickly converging uh, because of all the problem structure we have. So then once we've, uh, you know, done our SVI thing, it's time to compute some gradients. First, we can compute some flat gradients by sampling. So this is tractable sampling in, because we've set up our latent variable model to be tractable. This is really just using the reparameterization trick to draw a Monte Carlo sample and then differentiate through it to get all of our flat gradients. And then step four is just we can use all the information we've already computed to just write down a natural gradient over our sort of nice conjugate probabilistic graphical model uh, upstairs. Uh, variational parameters. So that's the that overview. I'm just going to show you two quick cartoons of, of what this looks like because I think they get some uh, some intuition across. These are, these are very toy examples. So <clears throat> imagine you have uh, some warped mixture model data. So shown here is the black dots in the left. So the idea is that um, this looks like something you'd like to fit a clustering model to, but if you fit just a regular Gaussian observation Gaussian mixture model, um, you know, maybe it won't fit these data very well because these have non-Gaussian cluster shapes. We want to adapt to that. We still want to learn some clustering information. So what we're going to do is put a Gaussian mixture model upstairs in the latent space and then have a neural network observation model that can learn this warping. Uh, so the left side is the view from the data space. The right side is the view from the latent uh, data space. And then the right side is the view from the latent space. Um, and I've initialized sort of the neural net to be an identity function. So as it trains, when I hit play, it's going to learn simultaneously a Gaussian mixture model and a way to warp uh, this data. Uh, so I'll hit play. You can see it's actually super fast at learning upstairs in the Gaussian mixture model because we have natural gradients, we have all kinds of problem structure. Um, <clears throat> so at the end, you can see that it's learned a nice model for our data. It's like a nice you know, density. We've also learned to parse out these clusters. We have explicit representations of, of multimodality. And more importantly, upstairs, these neural networks have actually worked with our model, right? They've tried to learn uh, 
uh, uh, feature representation so that our Gaussian mixture model prior actually fits the data well. Here's just one more example. This is a very simple time series. So this is, you should think of it as a, a, a video uh, where every frame is just one dimensional, right? So most people take two dimensional pictures of a one dimensional camera. Uh, so think of the horizontal index as time, as the frame index. The top panel is data. So every column in this, you can think of as a, as a kind of image. Um, the, when we're training on, you know, 80 sequences of about this length or something like this. Um, this is showing, uh, you know, an initialization, what the model's predictions are. It's, you know, it should look kind of like the data, and what the latent states are. So this is just an initialization. We're conditioning the model on the data up to this red bar. So uh, when I hit play, thanks for this, and then it, I really like this video. So it learns some, something really nice in a really nice order. It first learns a kind of representation of the data. So it learns an autoencoder can sort of, you know, do the, the reconstructions to the left of the red line quickly. But uh, if you remember, it wasn't able to predict very well. Um, so it sort of learns some kind of embedding of the data, but then it learns how to straighten it out so that the latent representation looks like a linear dynamical system. Then all these states popped into these nice sinusoids and we got these nice long-term coherent predictions. So, <clears throat> you know, the big picture here is that uh, you uh, young people in the audience might not believe it, but until recently, at this very conference, we used to design inference algorithms for a lot of like special graphical models with lots of conjugacy structure um, back in my day. And so, you know, all of these, all of these models uh, uh, have, you know, variational inference algorithms that are built for them. And, you know, with this sort of scheme uh, that we're proposing, these structured variational autoencoders, we can take all of those inference algorithms and use them in our latent variable models uh, and exploit them in, in this sort of algorithm template. So there's a lot of work uh, uh, to build on here. So another thing is that we can also answer arbitrary inference queries. You know, like I said, if you have an inference network, maybe you have a limited number of inference queries that you can answer until you have to train another. Uh, uh, if you have a new inference query, you might have to train another network. Um, you know, under this, uh, at least at the level of granularity of the graphical model, uh, we can answer any smoothing query you have or any sort of uh, data interpolation query. I have an asterisk here, which is see next slide which is that the granularity with which you can answer inference queries depends on what your recognition network is, right? And so another, uh, uh, I think, strength of this framework is that we don't have to just output node potentials, right? If you like your inference network, you can keep it. You can do as much inference with uh, a recognition model as you like. So in particular, we can use all those awesome, you know, time series inference networks. If you have nonlinear latent dynamics, use uh, uh, you know, this inference network from, from Evan Archer and co-authors, or use things uh, from, from David Sontag's group, and maybe if you have any other latent variables, you can do the PGM thing with them. So really, this is not, you know, just one single uh, uh, algorithm. I really like to think of this approach as giving us some giant knob for inference that lets us, you know, on one side we have all the conjugate exponential family probabilistic graphical model inference things, and on the other side, we have all of our inference being done with uh, neural network methods, you know, very flexible, uh, but maybe, you know, uh, uh, data intensive to train. And so you can really set this knob wherever you like, and, and you can interpolate between, uh, uh, you know, either of these two techniques. So I'm just going to mention one final uh, high-level idea. I think that supervised learning uh, uh, and, you know, discriminative learning is working really well, right? Um, and everyone says, you know, unsupervised learning, we're going to get to that next. So I think that, you know, everyone agrees that supervised learning, the way we can solve it, whether it's with kernel methods or with, uh, you know, deep learning methods, when we have these complicated nonlinear decision boundaries that we need to learn, what we do is we transform it, and we transform our data into some feature space where the problem's easy, right? In particular, in deep learning methods, we write down some sequence of feature transformations, maybe blow up the dimension, and the, all of those uh, uh, feature transformations at the very top layer, we're going to demand that the data are linearly separable, right? So it's like we're going to learn all of these feature transformations so that the problem is easy, so that it's linearly separable on top. And so I'd like to, to think about unsupervised learning in a similar way, to say that we have hard unsupervised learning problems. Maybe we can learn feature transformations that uh, uh, can map our data into some feature space where 
nice uh, uh, modeling assumptions work well. And by doing this sort of joint training, you know, our, our neural nets can sort of work with us to make these inflexible uh, you know, PGM type models uh, actually work in the latent space. So, with that, I want to thank again all of my uh, wonderful co authors at Harvard David Dubino, Alex Wolchko, Bob Data, and the Harvard Medical School, who worked with us on an application I didn't talk about, and of course, uh, Ryan Adams. Um, we have some code online, um, also uh, uh, work in progress, but uh, what's there is pretty, pretty nice. Um, and I'll take any questions. So, one thing about deep nets is that, you know, sometimes you have to fiddle around with the architecture and stuff like that. How much is that an issue in, uh, in your work? Oh yeah, totally. So, we, you know, try to inherit all the benefits of, like, you know, maybe these two approaches. Uh, but I think, you know, it's fair to say we also inherit their problems. So, it's not like using these methods makes deep networks easier to train. Um, you know, ultimately it looks like training variational auto queries as well. So it could be at a really high level that if, uh, you know, we're able to write down these, um, these biases, right, these, these priors in the latent space, if those are really good priors, right, if your priors are good, uh, if your biases are good, then that'll help you in, you know, statistical learning efficiency, and I think maybe also in training. Um, you know, but if they're bad, they might hurt you in training. So I can't say that, you know, we solve any of those problems particularly well. Uh, but, you know, we seem to be able to train uh, deep networks. These are, you know, sort of no harder to train than variational auto theories are. Yeah. Hey Matt, uh, thanks so much for sharing the work. Um, so, in the structured variational approach, is this sort of strictly better than the inference network approach in terms of representational, or, or strictly equivalent in terms of representational capacity, and therefore like overall strictly better, or do you lose something in representational capacity compared to the inference network? Yeah, great question about how does the representational capacity change. That's, a, I think there's, a, there's many facets to that question. So, first of all, if, for example, you had a Gaussian, you just had a Gaussian latent factor, and you had a fully connected neural network that outputted dense Gaussian, um, in the sense that, you know, you make a neural net big enough, it can simulate anything, I'm applying restrictions to what the inference looks like. Uh, so it's less, you know, in that sense less, uh, it has to be less general. It's very much like, um, you know, if you want to learn, if you want to learn your inference totally from scratch with, you know, very weak assumptions on what that inference computation looks like, then, uh, and you think that your neural network can learn to simulate, you know, message passing and uh, mean field fixed points and all kinds of things. If you can do all that, in some sense it's, it's less flexible. At the same time, there, there are advantages that we have in representation capacity. For example, we can, uh, it's very easy to write structured mean field assumptions, right? So many uh, methods, uh, uh, inference network methods might have problems with representing as much structure in the actual variational family. Um, whereas by writing these kinds of things down and using these variational inference methods, we can fit very rich, complex variational families well. So, yeah, I think the high-level point is that um, this is, you know, there, there's some trade-offs here where we are, you know, restricting the form of what the inference looks like, but what we're getting from that is a lot of, you know, computational tractability and maybe data efficiency and learning the inference network. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a trade-off. What I, I would like to, you know, think about how we can maybe interpolate between these methods. Instead of having to say, fix your inference method ahead of time, and uh, then you always have you know, whatever trade-offs, maybe when you have less data or early in learning, you want to make more assumptions about what your uh, latent variable model is doing and you know, do exact you know, linear dynamical system message passing. But maybe as, as you get more data, um, you'd like to say, well, that wasn't exactly right. Uh, maybe I have some non-linearities in my dynamics. And maybe I'm also going to have some more complex message passing that goes on that I'm simulating with a bidirectional RNN. Um, so it'd be really nice if we didn't have to just choose and say uh, one or the other. Um, thinking in this framework lets us, you know, set that knob somewhere. And you know, the ideal thing is if the knob sets itself, uh, if our agents can, like, you know, get more complicated inferences as they as they can support them. 
we can take more questions offline. Let's take the speaker.